Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today I wanted to dedicate an episode on the law of non-resistance, something that was taught by Buddha and Jesus, Aristotle, among others, and it goes along with our understandings of love. For many of you, you may be struggling because you're resisting and that resistance actually creates more problems than you're aware of. One of the things I've learned in the process of learning about manifestation and creating your reality is there is a law of non-resistance. If you resist, sometimes you create imbalancing forces and excess potential, and you'll end up getting exactly the opposite of what you're creating. So let's talk about this some more. This discussion of the law of non-resistance comes from Eric Butterworth in his amazing book, Discover the Power Within You, a guide to the unexplored depths within. Butterworth is a unity minister that has written a couple of great books, Life is for the Living, and You Make the Difference. In his outline of history, H.G. Wells gives the names of those who he believes to be the six greatest men who ever lived. And the name of Jesus heads the list. He says Jesus is entitled to human leadership because of his doctrine of non-resistance, the greatest truth ever uttered by man. The others on his list are Buddha, Asaka, Aristotle, Roger Bacon, and Abraham Lincoln, an interesting list of people with a wide diversity of backgrounds, obviously picked because they took a little from the world and left much. Abraham Lincoln was a man of great meekness and great strength, of great non-resistance and great accomplishments. Lincoln was once asked why he did not replace one of his cabinet members who constantly opposed him on every move he made. Typically, Lincoln answered with a story. Some years ago, I was passing a field where a farmer was trying to plow with a very old and decrepit horse. I noticed on the flank of the animal a big horse fly, and I was about to brush it off when the farmer said, Don't you bother that fly, ape. If it wasn't for that fly, this old hoss wouldn't move an inch. Lincoln is saying that the difficult people that he had to work with were providing the challenges that kept him digging in himself for greater strength. Thus, he was accomplishing great feats, not in spite of, but because of his opponents. It takes a great man to see and to admit to this. The thorn in the side that we resist so strenuously may be more important than we know in the accomplishments we do make or the success we achieve. One of the saddest things in life is man's propensity to use force to get his way, to use the battering ram instead of the key to open doors. This tendency is the cause of most of our world conflict and most of man's inner conflicts, which in turn cause most of his physical ills. Without a doubt, if Jesus' teachings of non-resistance were universally understood in practice, we would see an end to all war, to all conflict between nations, between factions, classes, and races. And we would see one giant step needed toward eliminating the root cause of all physical illness, this concept is found in Matthew 5, 29 through 49, the law of non-resistance. And if thy right eye causeth thee to stumble, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not thy whole body be cast into hell. And if thy right hand causeth thee to stumble, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not thy whole body go into hell. Matthew 5, 29 through 30. Jesus is a genius in the use of metaphor. He is pointing out here that the one true need in our lives is to get right in consciousness with God, and anything that is standing between us and our spiritual unity with God must go. The eye is a symbol in the metaphorical language of the East. One often hears it said, cut your eye from my boy, which means do not envy my boy. Or do not cut your eye from my family while I am away, which means look after their best interest in my absence. In our own idiom, we say keep an eye on him, which means to take care of him. We also say keep your eye skinned, which means to be watchful. Jesus wants us to root out thoughts of lust, covetousness, envy, and greed. He says it is better to lose the things we want 
than to acquire habits which would ultimately destroy our whole life. To cut off your hand in Aramaic means much the same thing. People often say to each other, cut off your hand from my vineyard, which means stop stealing my grapes, or his hand is too long, which means he is a thief. Jesus refers to the right eye and the right hand. This is a very important point. Right refers to what is good and right, and left refers to what is evil and wrong. It had been the left eye or hand, it would mean an evil kind of envy or lust and a selfish or even dishonest act, but the right eye or hand refers to those situations where your intent has been misjudged and where you have been unjustly treated. We may wonder why Jesus always uses these extreme cases as his illustrations. We can only assume that it was because he was a master psychologist. He knew human nature as no one has before or since. If he had talked about anger without cause, or in this instance of actual lust or stealing, this would have opened the door to much hypocrisy. It would be easy to nod one's head and agree, thinking he was talking about someone else. There's a story of a simple woman in a backwoods region who sat in church every Sunday, enthusiastically responding to every word of the sermon. One Sunday, as the preacher talked about the evil of drinking and gambling and swearing and carousing, the woman was right with him with her responses, Amen, praise the Lord, that's the truth, brother. Then the minister launched into a tirade against smoking. This caught our pipe-smoking grandma by surprise. She said in a voice audible through the entire church, There now. He stopped preaching and gone to meddling. With the Gospels of Jesus, there is no escape. The emphasis is upon you in every circumstance. He deals not with abstract commandments or vague religious ideals, but with basic thoughts and feelings. Everyone has had the experience of being unjustly treated for some act of good intention. Jesus is saying, even in these instances, if you are angry or upset, cut it out. Suppose you're moving with a line of traffic in your automobile and suddenly the traffic light changes and you're left out in the middle of the intersection. A harassed policeman comes over and proceeds to ball you out over blocking traffic, but you are a victim of the traffic and cannot possibly avoid the tie-up. You can angrily scream back at the officer at the price of a summons or an upset stomach, but it is not worth it. You should count the cost. You may feel that you have a right to be upset and angry, and you may go on carrying this upset with you through the rest of the day as you tell everyone about it. But to what avail? Why pay the price? The officer is having a bad day. Put yourself in his shoes for a while and you will realize what a nerve-wracking role is his in a busy traffic period. His anger is his problem. But why make it your problem too? Cut off your hand and say, Sorry, officer, I will try not to let it happen again. Silently send him a blessing of love and understanding and go on your way free. It was said also, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that every one that putteth away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, maketh her an adulteress, and whosoever shall marry her when she is put away, committeth adultery. Jesus is concerned with the tendency to run away from problems. As long as we take the way of escapism, the problems we run away from will continually come up in a new guise at every turning of the road. Jesus uses the theme of marriage and divorce as an example. Marriage is not a gateway through which two people in love enter into a land where they live happily ever after. Happiness in marriage is a conquest and not a bequest. Marriage is the license by which two people who have seen the greater possibilities in each other may work together to bring forth these possibilities. It is a laboratory of individual unfoldment. Marriage can only succeed when both parties see something of the divine in one another. If you cannot see beyond the appearances in another person, then you do not really love him. True love is spiritual perception and insight sensitive to the innate divinity. Sometimes it is said, I can't see what he sees in her. And of course, you can't. For it is the perception of love that is a personal revelation. Marriage based on that perception is built on rock. It will lead to an adjustment of difference and fulfillment of love. Without that perception, the house is built on shifting sands, and in storms and floods it will surely fall. Marriage 
is a phase of the overall experience of human unfoldment. If it brings love and bliss, then this is the outworking consciousness for both of the parties and undoubtedly there will be challenges or tests for them in other areas of life. If the marriage brings seeming conflict between the parties, if it is a great challenge to either or both of them, then this is the next step in growth which the soul has drawn to each one. If we are mindful of this, instead of saying, I don't have to stand for that, we will say, this is the reason why we are drawn together. This is why we were married. If we run away and find escape in divorce, this may well be putting off our salvation. If we brush off the fly, we may very well take away the stimulus for growth. One of Jesus' last words on the cross are recorded as Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, which Dr. Lamsa says translate from the um, Aramaic, my God, my God, for this was I kept. Jesus certainly could have said, I don't have to take this, but instead he said, this is a part of the great purpose of my quest to overcome death itself and prove the principle of the divinity of man. Now, Jesus did not change the Mosaic law, which allows divorce on the grounds of adultery, but he was condemning the abandonment of wives by husbands on the most trifling of grounds. Some Christian groups hold that divorce for any reason is unthinkable and immoral. They cite Jesus' declaration that what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder, Matthew 19.6. But God is spirit, divine law. What God joins together must be an energy field as relentless as gravity. How then can a marriage possibly fall asunder? The only conclusion is if a marriage can be dissolved, then it was never divinely joined. Any minister, priest, or rabbi would like to believe that the spiritual union takes place during the wedding ceremony and under his pastoral benediction. But most clergymen realize that the indissoluble marriage of souls is an ultimate that may take months and often years to reach in the relationship. The process of two becoming one flesh requires a lot of adjustment and a great deal of growing and maturing on the part of both parties. It is doubtful if Jesus would have said that divorce should never take place, but if there is a strong adulteration of the original perception that enabled the parties to see something of the divinity in each other, then it may well be that what God would put asunder let no man keep together. If there is a complete breakdown of communication and a closed-minded refusal to repair the break, then a continuation of the marriage might work to the detriment of the mental health of both parties. However, the tendency to escape from challenges is what Jesus has in mind. No matter what the relationship or experience, whether it is a marriage or employment or environmental problems, if the person seeks divorce as his first recourse, quitting the job, running away, then he is putting off his salvation. He has the habit of flicking off the fly. His life is denied the spur of challenge, and there is no great life, no abundant living without it. Socrates was once asked by a young man if he should get married. The great sage replied, Go ahead and marry. If you get a good wife, you will be happy. If you get a bad wife, you will become a philosopher, and that is good for any man. Life is a great and continuous process of growth. We move from the classroom to classroom, and in school we expect to be tested. School need not be an unhappy experience, but it is a happy time only if we are non-resistant to the process of growth and change. If we accept the test as blessings to us, if we are non-resistant to life's demands upon us, we will forge happily ahead toward the ultimate graduation. And perhaps no man has the vision to know what or when that graduation will be, for it is not yet manifest what man shall be. 1 John 3 2. Again, ye have heard that it was said to them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by the heaven, for it is the throne of God, nor by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, for thou canst make one hair white or black, but let your speech be, yea, yea, nay, nay, and whatsoever is more than these of the evil one. An understanding of the idiom is vital here if we are to know what Jesus has in mind. Hearing an Easterner doing business, you can immediately see the pertinence of this illustration. Buying a pair of shoes, for instance, might be a day's work. 
when the price cannot be settled by bargaining merchants and their customers generally take oaths by temples and holy names in proof of their sincerity. They may say, by God's name and his holy angels, his pair of shoes cost me six dollars, but you can have them for three. When this proves ineffective, they might resort to swearing. If I lie to you, I am the son of a dog. The shoes cost me three dollars, but I will let you have them for a dollar and a half. The suspicious customer might reply, but my only son's head, I will not pay you more than a dollar. Often if this method fails, the merchant will spit in the face of his customer saying, Raka, which means I spit on you. The Mosaic law forbade swearing by anything but God. Of course, it was done all the time anyway. But the master said, swear not at all. This means that we should not take or make vows. The main problem with the vow is that it is a mortgage on the future. For instance, if we impetuously proclaim, I will never speak to him again as long as I live, we are limiting future experience to our present low state of consciousness. Usually we come to regret such a vow. Either we break it with a sense of weakness of character, or we hold to it stoically feeling trapped by a regrettable decision. How often the alcoholic vows never to take another drink, and how easily is the vow broken, each time reducing his already low self-respect. The fine organization of Alcoholics Anonymous wisely insists that such vows should never be taken for periods longer than one day. The theory being that anyone can restrain himself for 24 hours, and at the end of that time, he has the satisfaction of accomplishment, then he can progress for another day. There is only the eternal now in which we live. All that we resolve and affirm ourselves should be for the present. Instead of saying, I will never be critical of anyone ever again, how much better to affirm, I am now free from criticism. I am loving and responsive to the divinity in everyone I meet. In this way, we are free from any pressure of resolutions, free to become what we really want to be. We may even wonder at the marriage vow, till death do us part. Can we really predict our future consciousness without mortgaging our future experience? It may be that one of the problems in marriage is the feeling of being trapped by divine or civil law. Maybe there is a subconscious resistance against the implication that you can never get out of marriage. Perhaps rebelling against that trapped feeling has given rise to rationalizations of incompatibility. Maybe the religious and legal restraints on marriage have caused more divorces than they have prevented. How much better it would be to replace the vow of marriage with a sincere consecration to behold the divinity in each other as a possibility and to work together to give releasement to the imprisoned splendor, which love has perceived. An annual or even daily consecration to the spirit of marriage is by far preferable to a once and for all vow to stay together come what may. T.S. Eliot characterizes the plight of so many marriages with devastating simplicity in this line from his cocktail party. They do not repine, are contented with the morning that separates, and with the evening that brings together for casual talks before the fire, two people who know they do not understand each other, breeding children whom they do not understand, and who will never understand them. Goth says that marriage is not a goal in itself, but an opportunity to mature. I wonder what would happen to the people in Eliot's play if they would arise every morning with the dedication to seek for the greater insight of love, to see one another in an entirely new light. In time, the morning would not separate, but would reveal joyous opportunities for a unity of goal and efforts. Many churches require members upon consecration of membership to solemnly promise that they will, for all their lives, continue to believe the doctrines of their particular sect. This is what Jesus wanted to prevent. Actually, if a person prays regularly and works to make his prayer experience real, he should grow in understanding. Certainly, he cannot go on holding exactly the same views as the years pass. Such a promise must surely mortgage his future of spiritual unfoldment, leading to the unforgivable sin. The unforgivable sin is simply the closed mind, the mind that is made up, that will not let the Spirit reveal new truths of how many individuals could it be said, I am a Methodist born and a Methodist bred, and when I die, there I'll be a Methodist dead. Jesus says, keep your mind open. Don't mortgage your future by making or taking vows. Be receptive to the continuous unfoldment of the truth in and through you. 
give thanks that life is lived one day at a time and that every day is a glorious opportunity to be strong, to overcome, to achieve, and to be happy. Now is the time of salvation. Ye have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, resist not him that is evil. But whosoever smiteth thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man would go to law with thee, and take away thy coat, let him have the cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Matthew 5, 38 through 42. This is one of the most profound messages of the entire Bible. It sets forth with unmistakable clarity the law of non-resistance. Unfortunately, it is not often taken seriously for it would seem to make impossible demands upon the Christian. The practical-minded person has said, Oh, this is a beautiful ideal that is typical of religion, but it is certainly not common sense. If you do not resist evil, it will overcome you. And if you do more than you are supposed to do, more than you're paid to do, people will take advantage of you. And he is right. It is not common sense. It is uncommon sense. Life has no meaning when it is motivated only by common sense because there is nothing common about this thing called life. It requires uncommon perception and an uncommon approach to commonplace things. The old law of an eye for an eye was designed to maintain some kind of order among a barbarous people. It was better than nothing. Actually, it has formed the foundation of a moral code which is still evident in modern civil and criminal law. The old law has been modified in our sophisticated modern sense of public justice, but human feelings are still sensitive to the old law justice. We still reveal the tendency to want to get even, to level things up somehow when we get hurt. The killing of President Kennedy's alleged assassin was this kind of old law justice in the eyes of one man. Jesus is saying, in effect, so you want to get even? That is a perfectly normal desire. However, you must know that there is only one way to get even with another who has wronged you. Love him and bless him and forgive him. You may hold a person in enmity for the rest of your days, reminding yourself continually of what he did to you. But every time you display this enmity, you are holding up your manacles and saying, see, I am making him pay the price. But you have become a slave in the process. The only way you can get even is to take off the manacles. Get rid of your enmity and you can go free. This may be a bitter pill, but it is one of the most important lessons of life. The command to turn the other cheek has been grossly misunderstood. It certainly doesn't mean that we should become doormats or invite further assault. It is strange when Jesus says, pluck out the eye. We know that he is using a metaphor that must be translated into modern idiom. When he says, cut off your hand, we know he doesn't mean it literally. Yet, we have missed a dynamic lesson because we have insisted on accepting the idea of turning the other cheek in a completely literal sense. Remember, Jesus has made the great discovery of the divinity of man. He is trying to help us realize that there is always a depth potential of strength within us, even in times of weakness. He is telling us that if we find ourselves upset over something another person has said or done, our upset indicates that we have been in the wrong state of consciousness. To react to it in this same state of mind only compounds the problem within us. Jesus says, turn to the other side of your nature. You're both human and divine. There is that in you that can never be hurt, that is always poised and peaceful, that knows your spiritual unity with God and knows that no one can take your good from you. In this diviner state of consciousness, the hurt is healed, the influence of the other person on you is nullified and you become a healing influence upon him. Sidney Harris, a distinguished news columnist, tells of visiting a Quaker friend for a weekend. Each evening he would walk to the corner with the friend to buy the evening newspaper. The man would be cheerful and pleasant, but the newsie would always reply with a grunt. Harris commented one night, He is a mighty unpleasant fellow, isn't he? The Quaker friend replied, Oh, he is always that way. But why are you so nice to him? The answer is a classic that reflects a deeper understanding of Jesus' law of non-resistance. The Quaker said, But why should I... Let him determine how I am going to act. Here was a man who knew that his chief responsibility in life was to act the part of his divinity. 
Why should he let any man on the street cause him to lower his consciousness and thus reduce his whole experience of life? Here was a man who understood himself. We can be certain that if he were to find himself flaring up with anger at some irregularity in another person instead of saying, what is the matter with that man? He would say, what is the matter with me? He would turn the other cheek or quickly remember, I'm not going to let him determine how I think and act. Remember, you may not be able to change or control the people around you, but you can determine the level of consciousness on which you meet them and react to them. This is one of the most significant discoveries that man can make. It will lead to a tremendous stability and confidence. You will come to know that no matter what happens in your world, you don't have to be afraid. You really do not need to worry or be anxious. You can determine your reaction and thus your course of action. Turn the other cheek and meet the experience on the level of your divinity and you will achieve self-mastery. The admonition to go to the second mile relates to the right of the Roman soldiers in Jesus' time to compel subject peoples to carry their burdens for one mile. It was the imposition of despotism, but the subject people could do nothing about it. Jesus indicates an uncommon sense way of doing something about it. They could break their bonds of enslavement by doing what was demanded of them as if they were really enjoying doing it. And that doesn't make any sense, does it? A man tells of going into a restaurant where they had a policy that if any waitress failed to give at least one smile to a customer, she was automatically discharged if caught. He said it was interesting to see the forced mechanical smiles of the waitresses who seemed the more unpleasant because of this imposition of the management. But one girl stood out. She smiled like the rest, but she kept on smiling, not just the one required smirk. She seemed to enjoy smiling. She actually beamed and radiated a contagious spirit of joy. He talked to the waitress about this. She said, well, at first I resented the order to smile and I almost quit my job. It was no fun smiling when you're compelled to. Then I began to realize that all the smiles except the first one were my own, free of orders. So I always went beyond that one forced smile to feel the reward of smiling and the result is I find it is an essential key to making my job an enjoyable experience. Jesus knew that when you do what is required of you and no more, you are slave. This is true whether it is meeting the whim of a demanding employer or keeping the laws of the land. To travel the first mile brings the paycheck, the forced smile, the formal thank you and the humdrum existence is all that is expected of anyone. But if you want routine living to become abundant living, you must give more. When you go the second mile, give more to your work, are more than thoughtful and kind to people, and become a joyous giver and a gracious receiver, suddenly life takes on a new meaning. On the second mile, you find happiness, true friends, real satisfaction in living, and probably a larger paycheck too. Someone has said, if you want to get ahead in your work, start taking advantage of your employer by doing more than is asked of you. But I do all I am paid to do. And that may be true. They don't pay you for the extra joy and enthusiasm you put into your work. But then your pay can't give you satisfaction and a sense of fulfillment either. The person who receives only a paycheck for his work is underpaid. And this is true even if he is paid in six figures. The true compensation of joy and fulfillment in a job begins where duty leaves off. When Jesus says, Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. He doesn't mean that you should go out and fill every beggar's cup or become a soft touch for everyone who comes seeking a loan. This injunction is given in the context of the law of non-resistance. Let's face it, humanly we all resent the intrusion of him that asketh. There are two ways in which we can turn him away. First, we can bluntly and unkindly reject the overture, but in terms of the damage to our own stability of consciousness, the cost may be more than the money we have withheld. Secondly, we can give him the gift or make the loan to get rid of him, but in this case, we may have hurt him more than we have helped, for we have brushed the fly away, thus removing the one motivation that might ultimately lead him to overcome the, his problem. When you see the beggar or friend, approaching if you find resistance welling up in you turn the other cheek immediately get your mind on the loving non-resistant christ consciousness you cannot really afford to do less from the level of your divinity you will respond to the request with love and understanding you will recognize that he has a problem which may go deeper than his need for financial help you will salute the divinity within him and deal with him on this level 
Now in this consciousness, you can deal with him from the standpoint of his highest good. You may give him the money in the faith that he will use it wisely and responsibly, or you may be led to withhold the gift, but to give him the blessing of your wise and loving counsel. Your blessing may help him to create a new self-image, to find new self-respect, to rise to new faith in his ability to meet life. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could always meet people in the consciousness? The beggars and irresponsible borrowers of the world would soon disappear. Perhaps it is at this point that the war on poverty must begin. Maybe we have been failing our needy by simply flicking off the fly. In so doing, we have taken away both their incentive and their self-respect. Perhaps more important than taking people out of the slums is the task of taking the slums out of people. Money may not be able to solve the problem alone. Maybe we need to salute the divinity in these people to help them by our prayer and praise to be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Ye have heard that it was said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies and pray for them, that persecute you, that ye may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if ye love them that love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren, only what do ye more than others? Do not even the Gentiles the same? Ye therefore shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew 5, 43-48 Socrates once said that the unexamined life is not worth living. Jesus is constantly challenging us to take a good look at ourselves in the context of the divine potential within us. We must recognize that the basic problem in life is the frustration of our own potentiality. When we are faced with inharmony in relationships, it is not so much a problem between ourself and another who seems to be fighting us as it is a break in our own circuit of good from the Father within. Life is consciousness. The problem we face indicates that our wires are down. We need to repair the break within ourselves. The only existence an error condition has, as far as we are concerned, is that which we give it in our own thinking. Withdraw the thought about it and it fades into nothingness. What matters to us in reality is not people or things or conditions in themselves, but the thoughts and feelings we harbor concerning them. It is not the conduct of others, but our reaction to it that makes or mars our life experience. Jesus challenges us to get a good understanding of this thing called love. He says, you do not really love simply because you love those who love you. What does that prove? It is easy to be nice and friendly to those who are nice to you. It is no problem to love thy neighbor as long as we have something to say about who that neighbor may be. Love is not an emotion that begins in us and ends in the positive response of another. Love is divine energy that begins in God and has no end. We tune in on this energy and are moved by it as it flows through us. Shakespeare says, love is not love which alters when it alteration finds. The classic illustration of this is in the statement, I loved him with all my heart, but after what he did to me, I hate him with a passion. On the level of his divinity, man has tremendous and limitless powers as his inheritance. However, they are his to use only when he acts the part of his divinity. So Jesus is saying, love your enemy, not because he is especially deserving of your love, because when he causes you resistance, you're not acting the part of your divinity. And the power that goes with your divinity is only yours when you act the part. A light bulb is nothing more than that unless it is turned on. When the connection is made with electrical energy, it becomes a radiant source of light and warmth. Man is a spiritual being, a child of God, heir to all the infinite potential that inheres in all God's creation, including love, the strongest single force in existence. But in reality, the fulfilling of the power of our divinity comes only when we are attuned to the Father and are expressing His love, light, and power. At any time, under any circumstances, we can turn on the light and the infinite energy of love will dissolve darkness, heal broken relationships, and become a veritable protecting presence. Man is a creature of light. When his light is shining brightly in all directions and in all situations, he is imperturbable, indefatigable, and undefeatable. Nothing shall be impossible unto him. 
how we frustrate this potential of light. Consider this practical example if we were to walk into a room full of people who were being hampered in their work by lack of light and if you had a bright lamp in your hands, would you turn your lamp down in reaction to the dim light of the room? No, you would bring in as much light as you possibly could but if you walk into a room of hostile people, what is your reaction? Normally you meet their hostility with hostility of your own and walk away saying, what an unfriendly bunch of people. You may say, but I am only human. This is the understatement of your life. You are not only human, you are also divine in potential. The fulfillment of all your goals and aspirations in life depends upon stirring up and releasing more of that divine potential. And there is really nothing difficult about letting this inner light shine. All we must do is correct the tendency to turn off our light when we face darkness. A woman was walking home from a meeting at her church. It was very late at night and the streets were very dark. As she walked past an alleyway, a thief put a gun to her back and said, Give me your purse or I'll kill you. The normal human reaction to such an experience would be to turn off the light instantly and then to experience fear, anger, bitterness, and outright hatred. All these qualities are the frustration of our potentiality of the healing and protecting power of love. It was of just such experience as this that Jesus spoke when he commanded, Love thine enemies and pray for those who despitefully use you, that you may be sons of your Father. In other words, love them, not because they deserve it, but because you deserve it and need to keep your love energy flowing. Anyway, this frail little woman turned and looked the thief right in the eyes and said, You can't hurt me because you are God's child and I love you. He said, Look, lady, this is a gun and I mean to kill you if you don't give me your purse. But she simply repeated softly without any evidence of fear and excitement. But you can't hurt me because you are God's child and I love you. He stood for a moment puzzled, shocked, and disarmed. His hand shook, his face flushed, and he dropped his gun and ran. This man was completely overpowered by love and non-resistance. Unfortunately, a person is often filled with fear and anger at such a moment, leading him to do unwise things. Perhaps he tries to run or to overpower the assailant, but he has turned off his light and thus he is meeting darkness with darkness, resistance with resistance, and he is now on the level of the thief. Now he is in great danger. He may blame the thief for what may ultimately happen, the loss of his purse or the injury caused by the frightened culprit. But from the standpoint of the law of consciousness and of realizing the potential of the divinity of man, the real crisis resulted when the victim turned off his light and thus fearfully caused a break in his relationship with the light of God within himself. So no matter what the difficulty around you or the darkness before you, turn on the light. No matter what happens, turn on the light and keep it on. Ye shall therefore be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is another important evidence that Jesus taught the divinity of man and that man is intended to continue in unfoldment until he expresses and experiences the dynamic life of God. I once heard a preacher say, Jesus challenged men with unattainable goals. The fact is, of course, these goals are impossible for weak sinful humans to attain. He knew that we had better have the goals that are beyond our grasp or what's heaven for. And this is correct. It is impossible for weak, sinful humans to fulfill the absolute teachings of Jesus. But why be a weak, sinful human? Jesus is saying, Much is expected of you because you are well endowed. You are a child of God, created in His image likeness, possessed of the potential of the Christ indwelling. You are a growing, expanding, evolving, dynamic life idea in God mind. There can never be a limit to God and thus there can never be a limit to you if you get into God consciousness. It is not that Jesus challenges us with unattainable goals, but that he is continually reminding us of unclaimed possibilities. Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom before you from the foundation of the world. Matthew twenty-five thirty-four. And this concludes the Law of Non-Resistance by Eric Butterworth. It's a very powerful and important teaching that we all need to hear and understand. It's easy to become influenced by what you see in the news and the people in your life. You may have people that are angry and hateful towards you, 
and your reaction towards them is incredibly important. You can change the world by the way you react to them. Love your enemies. And in moments of conflict, such as the story of this woman, find the love. It's so hard. I know. I write about it in my book about an event that happened in my house, a robbery gone bad where some people were robbing my home and I encountered somebody with a gun. He shot at me. In that moment, I never felt any hate or anger. I ran. I could have tried to find a weapon and go after him, but I didn't. I simply found this glowing portion of inside of me that felt like I was safe. I could see the safety and I could feel it. And there's some sort of presence that entered in me. Many of you can probably tell a similar story and we're being tested all the time. We have events that are happening all the time now that are showing us the power of these lessons. You're going to meet hateful people that are going to be in conflict with you. Right now, there is so much polarity, especially in the media. They bring it out, especially in politics and other things. People are angry and hateful and violent in the words they use towards each other. And that's fine. That's just a dynamic of third density earth that we're in. Don't treat it like it's unusual or weird and don't be personally offended by it because you are God. Your divinity is so powerful that you can simply look at them and love them and forgive them and know that they're in a state that they are expressing a disconnect or separation from the God light. And if you give them love in those moments, you become an example that even though they'll retain their anger and hate in that moment, they'll look back on it and it will change them. They'll see the power of love and they'll see it in the way that you reacted in the way they responded in their heart and it will open up their heart. We're not gonna open up the hearts of those that are angry and hateful by responding with anger and hate. I'm just as guilty as anyone else. I've expressed anger and hate many times for ridiculous things. And I see now if I had responded differently in those moments, they would have changed completely. This particular writing from Eric Butterworth devotes a little bit of time to marriage and that's a great place to look you're going to find moments where you just want to escape and that is something that you shouldn't do you can find the power of love even in the worst moments and you, there's no need for you to be in resistance it's tough your natural inclination is to resist but just try it don't resist the law of non-resistance will work for you and for the better. It is the power of love and you change the nature of the environment you're in and the relationships you're in when you respond with non-resistance, just as Gandhi did when he didn't resist violently the British in India. And this created a movement of many other people that did not respond violently and it changed the world. Look at Martin Luther King. He responded by advocating for nonviolence and non-resistance and it worked there is so many things that we can accomplish outside of hate and anger and violence simple non-resistance and accepting the love in the moment is the key please share your experiences in the comments of the power of, of non-resistance other people need to know about your story it's important you can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to The Reality Revolution.